example, a Siamese twin is essentially one human being. If we're going to talk about a being as a human, a Siamese twin would re represent one human being with two persons. Now you have two heads. So the question of what is a human being gets a little complicated. And obviously we can't make this a perfect analogy to something we don't even fully understand, spirit. But the Bible doesn't make that separation. Never talks like that. It just refers to the people. So it speaks in terms, in my, in my JW Defended book, I do go through this. I do have subsections on person and being, and there may be some newer ways, but you, you know, the discussion is not going to change. It's not going to ever end for those who are committed to that, that understanding. They just cannot see the Bible calling Jesus God without him being God in the metaphysical sense that the Trinity promotes it. So, whereas again, look at what Jesus answer was. John 10, the Pharisees, the Jews came to him and they were going to stone him. All right. And I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the account, but it essentially refer to it, I think accurately. And he said, well, why are you stoning me? What, what, what have I done? And they said, we're not stoning you for something you've done. We're stoning you because you, even though claiming to be a man, make yourself a God or God. Let's just say either or for now. Okay. So here you have Jesus. Now, in Trinitarian's view, he's the son of the Trinity. He's in, that, in the Trinitarian uh, view of God. He's the son. He knows exactly who he is. He knows why he's there. He knows who they are. He, so he understands everything. He's, he's God the son in their view. What was his answer? His answer was, is it not written? He I said, you are gods. And he's, he's quoting Jah speaking to the other gods there. And it doesn't matter if those gods in Psalm 82 are angels or human judges. It makes no difference because Jesus is the one who cites the text. If that's not Greg Stafford citing this text and saying, well, this is what it means. I'm quoting, I'm just reading what Jesus does. It's not like John 10. We'll set aside the God or a God part of John 10. Um, for now, you can be, uh, other than that, there's no translation problem here. There's no issue, no difficulty with the text. So Jesus clearly refers to Psalm 82 and says, if he said this, then why is it a problem if I said that? If these sons of God against whom God's word came can be called gods. Now notice he uses the term gods. He doesn't refer to them as persons or make a difference in order to avoid polytheism between person and being, right? I mean, he, this is the son of God. Who, who more than God the son would preserve the right understanding of a text that God the son is quoting to defend his identity? He's quoting a text that refers to other beings, Beings, persons, same thing. There's no, he's not differentiating. It's a plural, gods. As gods in a sense that he doesn't deny. And then says, if this is okay, what's wrong with me claiming to be the son of God? So in his mind, it was the same thing as well. Claiming to be the son of God was the same thing as what they were saying he said he was, a god. Trinitarians will say he was claiming to be God, but that makes no sense. Zero to then quote Psalm 82 and the use of gods to explain why it's okay for you to call yourself God. Well, the Jews would have just looked at him and said, well, listen, we're not talking about the false judges or the God or whatever. We're talking about you claiming to be God. That text has nothing to do with God, that has to do with God. That, that would have been the easy comeback. And it would have shown that Jesus was quoting a text that didn't have anything to do with what they were accusing him of. That's not what happened. That's not what he did. He quoted the text that answered their accusation and showed that he was correct. Simple. It, that's it. 
Now, how far beyond that do you want to go? How far beyond that do you want to engage with someone who won't accept that? To me, I don't know that you can make a lot of progress with someone who's not going to accept Jesus' own defense of himself by referring to a text that says exactly what we're talking about, that sons of God can be called gods and that even Jesus is a God in the sense that he's the son of God. <laughs> to me, it's very simple. And I don't mean to, to be, you know, I understand it can be complicated. And at one time it was because you have to go through these different questions and these different translations. But when, when you spend as much time as I have with them, you realize, well, wait a minute. You know, these texts were pretty simple. And it's not like this is Plato or, or Aristotle I'm dealing with here. This is an account of a figure who taught in fairly plain language. Yes, there are some things that are a little bit difficult or you know not as easy to understand as they were back then. But those are very few in my opinion. And this is not one of them. The text itself answers the question that's so often asked us. Why do you guys promote? We're not promoting polytheism. We're promoting the biblical view of being a son of God. And how you can either be your own God like Satan and these other demons. Or you can be Jah. You can be like Jesus, a son of God who represents his father. Who does his father's will. Because there's no one better than Jah. There's no one else to be. And that's the choice these spirits have. Be their own self or be Jah. And if, what, what greater honor and glory could you have than, than Jah allowing you to act like him and be considered him because you do it exactly right. Um, so these accounts, I think if you look at them more carefully and you simplify it and you get beyond a lot of this discussion, you start talking person and being, you're going to have a long day because the Bible doesn't talk that way. The Bible doesn't make those separations. And like I said, Jesus' quotation of the account in Psalm 82 is directly contradictory to any attempt to try to say that when he's called God or when it says like in John 1, 1, he was with God, that that means they substitute, they take out the being word, God. That's a being, right? Even to them, one God. So he's with God and they say, well, that's the person of the father being or God becomes person of God. I've talked about this many times before, but um, they're just not understanding the biblical use of the term God. And I'm, I'm giving Trinitarians a, a pass. I'm trying to. I'm trying to move us beyond the older discussions. I know it's a tall order, but I'm going to try. Because I think if we don't, it's going to be used against us continuously by non-Christians. And so I'm trying to simplify it for us. And I'm trying to keep us from engaging nonstop with Trinitarians that will push us out of these texts and into these discussions of person and being. They don't know what things are like in the spirit realm to the extent that they can define metaphysically a person or a being in that sense. If it's not expressed in the Bible that way, you better be very careful about claiming you understand the metaphysicality of something that's not taught that way. So what we are taught is in Hebrews chapter one is that Jesus is in the son is the character of the father's being. It uses the word for being there and says Jesus is a copy of his being. And so that obviously indicates generation. But you know, the other thing with Trinitarians often John 118 is great because that shows. So if you notice in my translation, I use a translation uniquely begotten. And um, that's because the term manas, it's, it's composed of two words. I'm not defining it based on that, that composition, but it, but managanes is manas and genes. So manas can be, can mean only. And only if there's only one of something or if it's the only thing, it's, it's unique, right? It has a sense of a unique quality to it only in and of itself. So it's not, it, it is in fact appropriate there because we know that God has other sons. That's talked about multiple times in the Hebrew scriptures. And we know that in Hebrews, it talks about um, the birth of Isaac um, as being Abraham's 
uh, only begotten or him being uh, the only begotten of Abraham and Sarah. So that's a unique, also a unique generation, right? That happened because of Jah. He allowed her to become pregnant. So it was unique. It, it wasn't that he was, Isaac was Abraham's only child. The generation of Isaac was unique in that Jah allowed it to occur when it otherwise would not have. So there's a unique begotten, uniquely begotten. Isaac was uniquely begotten. Jesus was uniquely begotten. And um, those terms are qualifying the term theos. So you're never going to find the father referred to that way. Even in the, the later church writings, he's always the, the unbegotten God. So they maintain that distinction. But once you get a Trinitarian committed to person and being, they're, every single term that refers to God, they're going to see as a person of God. And you're just going to go through this constant series of textual reinterpretations or substitutions. And you'll you'll have to call them on the very first one because otherwise you just jump from text to text and they'll keep saying, well, that's that's in his human form or that's, that's from his personal self. They never talks like that. Jesus doesn't say, you know, he refers to himself always as his whole person. So when they want to read into it, a separation of persons, they're really saying that Jesus is two persons. That's the only logical conclusion you could draw because on the one hand, he says, I don't know everything. Only the father knows some things. But on the other hand, they say he maintained his divinity and so therefore would have to have maintained his omniscience. See, for us, that's completely consistent with Philippians 2, right? He emptied himself of the divine form. He did have, the term harpagmon, can, it can have a, a quality of, of seizing because of the verb harpazo, but really harpagmon, is, is, it's, it's a noun. And so it refers to something, and then the verbal aspects of harpazo get involved. So something that the NWT says didn't consider it, uh, didn't consider a seizure, namely that he should be equal to God, a seizure. And or as in, in my translation, I believe I put it as something to exploit. So I do that because I believe that it's talking about the equality that Jesus had with the father as a divine being, as a spirit. So he was in the same form as God. In the same way, I'm in the form of a man. William's in the form of a man. David's in the form of a man. We're equal in that way. We're flesh. We're not exactly equal. We have differences and features, and we have different knowledge. But if, as far as equality of being, we're equal. We're exactly the same in terms of our composition, flesh. So... When it talks about spirits being equal, remember also it talks about when Jesus said that the, the, those who are resurrected, uh, the Pharisees tried to trap him and they said, well, whose wife would she be? She had several wives and then she died. Well, remember Jesus said, well, they, she doesn't belong to any of them because those who are resurrected from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are equal to angels. So, that doesn't mean that they're equal in every way and certainly not equal in their age, right? No human's equal to an angel in age unless an angel was recently created after we were. We wouldn't know that. But assuming they haven't been created since we've been made, um, just for our discussion, then we know that that's dealing with a specific equality. The fact that they don't marry like the angels once they've been resurrected. Whether that means they're going to be in a spirit form or not, is, is make it, we'll find out. But they're equal in that respect. So that answered the question. And so when it talks about Jesus having an equality, it's the same thing as in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. So he's on an equal plane. He's with him in the heavenly realm as a divine being, a spirit, his son. Same with the other sons, but he's the only begotten, the firstborn, right? These are all terms that are used that convey uh, something very specific and unique about Jesus. And we're told right in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 21, 17, that the firstborn is the beginning of one's generative power. Okay? Jesus hasn't been appointed firstborn and there's someone else that's Jah's firstborn and we just don't know who it is. The firstborn is a prominent figure and that's why it's Jesus. He's the one doing all these things because he's unique and he's firstborn. So 
Um, there is an equality, but he gave that up rather than exploit it. This goes back to what I was saying. So versus calling it a seizure or so, an act of seizing, like trying to take something that's not yours, which is possible. It seems more like to me that having that equality existing as a divine spirit, he gave it up. He didn't consider it something to exploit. So if you were in a, a divine form like Satan, so spirits, so evil spirits that are in a powerful form, likely have authority to some extent, they can exploit that. They, we can exploit our human authority and, and, and form. Well, they, they, they can do it too, but Jesus didn't. Instead, he lowered himself. Again, now think of the pre-flood days. What did the sons of God do? They tried to elevate themselves by coming down and establishing the kingdoms on this earth with the daughters of men. What did Jesus do? He lowered himself didn't accept any kingdom, didn't even accept a wife, and focused solely on Jah, like all those other sons of God should have done as well.